Okay, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me here. It's, it's my second participation in a meeting like this. First one I was uh, participating, that was in Uru Preto, Minas Gerais, a few years ago, and I'm happy to be back here. It's uh, always a very interesting meeting because it's a kind of small crowd, but very interested, so I like it a lot. Uh, I guess, however, that uh, we will switch gears completely from the previous talk about Markov processes. Uh, we get, uh, at least from that point of view, deep into the application. But I hope to get some conceptual things across about the problems we, we are facing when we look at simulations of soft matter. And today I would like to talk mostly about adaptive resolution simulations of soft matter, uh, which means in the end that we are looking for open systems molecular dynamic simulations. We want to be able eventually to have a molecular system and to feed in either particles or energy or whatever in order to see how does it react because we want to understand eventually processes in soft matter, synthetic or biological, uh, with uh, molecular or atomistic uh, resolution. Over the years, this topic in minds uh, uh, was very important for us. So here, some of the names are written in red. There, they are not. Let me see. Is that better? Yeah, then, okay. Uh, and and uh, the work I'm talking about is... is goes back to early collaborations with Luigi Delicite and Matei Propotnik, and then the more recent work is uh, together with Debashish Mukherjee, Eva Fugati, uh, Raffaello Potestillo, and Carsten Kreis. So whatever names which are in red on my laptop. <laughs> but, uh, and, and over the years also a number of different funding agencies uh, supported this work besides the Max Planck Society itself. Uh, before we, we go on, let me, let me get back to, to the standard problem we face with soft matter, uh, un, unlike many um, hard matter issues. Why, why is soft matter soft? So why is tissue soft? Uh, tissue is soft because we have a fairly low energy density, cohesive energy density, that comes along with nanoscopic length scales, typically between 10 angstroms and maybe a thousand angstroms, so 100 nanometers. This together means that we have large conformational fluctuations, and that means that in most cases, when we look into these systems, we have to deal with large intramolecular entropy. And that is as important as intra or intermolecular energy. So that's the same scale, and that means that the thermal energy, KT, is the relevant uh, energy scale we have to deal with. And you can take here your favorite choice, at room temperature, uh, KT is about 4.1 times 10 to the minus 1 joule. And depending in which community you are, you either d deal with electron volts, and you see already 10 to the minus 2, 2.5 times 10 to the minus 2 electron volts for people coming from electronic structure, so that's nothing. And, uh, or 10 to the minus 4, uh, 10 to the minus 3 E Hartree. Uh, one, one I like especially is 4.1 piconewton nanometers. That's what the biophysics people use and so on and so on, and for classical chemistry units, 0.6 kilocalorie per mole or 2.5 kilojoule per mole. And uh, when you have a paper where these, these units are mixed, then all lamps of alarm should go on if they are not compared uh, properly in, in, in one publication. And this should be compared to typically a chemical bond, a carbon-carbon bond at room temperature has about 80 kT, and e to the minus 80 for us is zero. That means unless you have some chemical reaction, this never changes. These things live forever, and you all know about the environmental problems we have with bonds like this, which live forever. And a typical hydrogen bond uh, uh, is somewhere between 4 and 10 kT, depending on the dielectric constant of the environment. And, uh, and that, uh, when you map this onto a time scale, that is the typical intrinsic time scale for functional molecules, either in our body or somewhere else, which, which uh, is related to the lifetime of these uh, of these hydrogen bonds. And so it makes a lot of sense that, that we have a lot of hydrogen bonds in our body taking care of participating in the functions and so on and so on. And uh, uh, just to remind you what this is, so this is a, a red laser point. I have a green one as well. 
So each green light photon is about uh, 2 to 2.5 EV, about 100 kT. So this is about 60 kT, what comes out of here, 50 to 60 kT with each photon. And this is also a dramatic challenge for all atom simulations because typically the accuracy of a classical all atom force field which is used in chemistry, which is used in biochemistry, has an error bar of at least several kT. Even if you do top quantum chemistry and Mabito experiment, an error bar of 5, 6 kT is a very small error bar for an individual interaction. And if you then look at a giant molecule, the total energy uh, uh, error for, let's say, the cohesive energy of a protein easily is about 100 kT. Because of that, it's not surprising that typical denaturation temperatures which people get from simulations of gigantic molecules are 6, 7, 800 uh, Kelvin and not 310 Kelvin or so as you have in, in biology. So that means in order to really progress there, one has to link atomistic or quantum aspects to more coarse-grained uh, uh, models and has to reparameterize models on the way depending on what you are looking at. And uh, so we use a number of different softwares uh, we do a little bit of quantum chemistry in-house, people in, in minds, but if you go to hardcore quantum chemistry, we go to the specialists, of course. And the two programs which we developed ourselves in minds, Espresso++ Plus Plus and Vodka Simulation Program, the program to parameterize uh, uh, coarse grained interactions and charge transport in organic electronics, we are both open source. Everybody is, is welcome to use them and also to participate in the further development of these programs. So what it means for soft matter is, in, is that one has to link local chemical properties, which is essentially an energy dominance of local bonds and bond angles and so on and so on, uh, to scaling behavior of nanostructures or the entropy dominance of a large-scale part. This has to be combined. And only if I combine these two things, or the two screws to adjust, which have the same strength, the same importance, then I will be able to uh, eventually become quantitative. Now. And uh, so we had uh, yesterday uh, from uh, Jean Bachmann, we had this very nice talk about this generic properties, which is, of course, extremely important as kind of anchor points to know where we are and where we might go. But to go from one p place in this, in this scheme somewhere else might be just the result of tiny changes in the local chemistry. And this, this is the link which, uh, of a problem which one is facing when one deals with that. So there are two different ways of doing that. One way is uh, a sequential way. So this is an example of P3HT, one of the most important uh, uh, molecules, or not, not most important in the, in the term of application, but in, ter in the term of research, in the context of organic electronics, where one can go from a very coarse model and then run that system, map one back on a more detailed model, and so on. Eventually, that one arrives at an all-atom uh, uh, model of the system and can study then the local morphologies and that one can do either in this direction or that direction. Or one can try to do it in a more concur in a concurrent way that one locally has atomistic details while further outside one has a coarse-grained system. And, uh, and then of course one needs a free exchange between these different regions of, of detail or in other terms molecules which go from here have to assume atomistic degrees of freedom when they go here and then they go back and I will come back to that later on. Let me first just very shortly uh, uh, say a few words about this and then we go into the details of this uh, uh, adaptive resolution uh, scenario. This kind of sequential uh, methodologies, they work quite well now and, and there are many, many different approaches developed over the years here. Just a few examples of, uh, from mines of a surrounding of mines and there are many more others, like uh, with uh, the groups in, in Darmstadt and, and uh, in, in China, there are many groups, Japan and the US and so on. Let me give you one example. That's, that's the P3HT, which I mentioned in the beginning. And for uh, organic electronic devices, uh, this is something which is very important if it comes for, for biochips, when you have... Um, when you are looking into, into sensors, which you maybe what people are thinking of get implanted and you automatically get your blood data transmitted somewhere else. For people who are sick, that might be very important, but also in the context of, uh, of electronic techs uh, and then solar energy and so on. 
So what you have here, you have a typical mixture of a donor and acceptor uh, system. And what you need in order to have charge separation and then charge transport, you have to on the one hand have interface between these two different components, but also the morphology of this component has to be in a way that, uh, that you not only can uh, charge such a polymer, but also then you have to be able to transport charge in that system. And the transport of a charge in that system, of course, on the one hand needs a percolation, that's trivial, but it also needs a local arrangement uh, of these systems. And not only, and you not only want to have, uh, want to be able to transport charge along the conjugated backbone, you also have to be able to transport charge from one of these chains to the other, otherwise you're stuck to a small piece, and then you are, that's it. And, uh, and that would be not so difficult if I would just have this piece. However, such a conjugated object is essentially soluble in nothing. You can show in classical, in a very classical polymer sense, that the theta point, which means the point where the chains aggregate for a rigid rod is inf infinite temperature. Because you do not have the entropy which fights with infinitesimal dispersion interaction. If you make it long enough, it's always much larger than KT. So what you have to do is, you have to add aliphatic side chains to make it soluble at all, but that means you have to deal with that later on in the packing and in the processing. So you have things which fight each other, and in principle, to make a, a perfectly processable organic electronics polymer uh, is, a, is in contradiction to the optimal morphology afterwards for electronic properties. And that is the, com that is for the compromise these people have to fight, and, and we have quite a few in the lab who fight that. Uh, from an experimental point of view. And so I would like to look at this and understand this in, in more detail. And uh, so what we did in that case, for instance, we started out, that was work with Kostas Daulas and Dennis Andrienko and, and two PhD students. And we really started out with a very coarse-grained soft sphere model uh, for this P3HT and then systematically introduced more details in order to be able to look at the atomistic conformations of such a system, which in a, in a simulation you can never equilibrate uh, uh, from scratch in, in all detail, and then look, for instance, at the electronic properties of the system, and that is what you see here as a, as a plot. Let's see, it's even better, just concentrate on this one, uh, of the ioniza ionization energy in the P3HT, which means the energy you need in order to get a charge in the first conduction band, and then it can travel in the system. And you see that this in the amorphous phase, its distribution is, is very unfavorable compared, oops, oops, compared to the biaxially ordered phase where you have large areas of very low ionization energy. And that means that is something you can, uh, you can then use. And here again, we have this competition of energy scales. You see here this ionization energy is 4.5 EV, way, way above KT. But, but tiny changes in the local arrangement lift this energy to very high energies. So they, you have to, again, you have, you have this interplay of this mismatch of, mis, uh, mismatch of energies which you, which you have to fight. And uh, I want to just uh, show you one, one outcome of this study. Uh, forget all the other things here. What you see here is the ionization energy as a function of the conjugation length in the system. And, uh, uh, and you, you see that this ionization energy kind of levels off at a fairly short conjugation length, and that, and this leveling off is related to the order you can introduce. And this is something which you might say, so what? But this is a very important information for the chemists who want to make these systems, because, because of proper, when you have a proper organization, you do not have to make very long polymers. You can make relatively short polymers, where you have only an, a conjugation along the backbone up to, let's say, five to 10 units, because, here, each kink breaks the conjugation, and when you have a short system, you can avoid the den you can reduce the density of kinks, and that is an enormous uh, um, advantage of synthesis, but especially of processing. So you can really that you can use as a kind of guide to molecular insight of how to process these systems, and uh, this is important in many respects. First of all, one would like to understand what happens on a molecular level. And, and second, um, when you, I don't talk a lot to companies because they say you are, you are 
too far away from our, our zoot which we have here in, in the production. However, um, companies typically say we do not want to have new molecules. We only want to have new molecules if they make a huge market. And, and one of the reasons is, uh, is reach. Uh, the, the registration restrictions for new materials which are exposed to the, to the environment. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to license a completely new molecule. Uh, that, that, uh, that causes, for I think in general at least good reasons, enormous problems in testing and then checking uh, all kinds of things from degradability all the way to toxicity and so on, that they are only willing to, to introduce something really new if they think they can really make big money with that. And that, of course, for somebody like me is, is something which is far out of what I can do and what I'm thinking about. But we, one has to keep it in mind when one talks to these people. So in this whole game of organic electronics, and I think this is a kind of prototype also when we look at more bio-related molecules uh, and, and other areas of food, it's the same problem, even worse when it comes to food polymers. And all our food is soft matter, you know. Uh, Florian müller plate whom some of you know here, once said to me, well, the major difference between the yogurt and the, and the pot surrounding the yogurt is the degree of polymerization. And so what we eat is soft matter in most cases, of course. So you start out with a molecular structure here, then you have to uh, parameterize a more coarse-grained model on different levels so that you might be able to get something to, uh, like morphology. And then you, can ha you have to go back, introduce the details in order let's to, for instance, be able to, to look locally at the, at the transport of, of charges, which needs some quantum chemistry based on conformations you have from there. And then you can there then uh, construct mobility matrices and using uh, Kramer's equation and related methods to calculate uh, uh, electronic properties. And so that means quantum chemistry, statistical physics, solid state physics, and device modeling really has to merge in order to be able to do that. And that is clear also that you can only do this when you have a team of people who are collaborating. The question, of course, now is, for many questions I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, do I really always need this, this whole system on one level and then run run very big systems. Do we need that or, or even do we want to do that? And, uh, and that le uh, gets me to this point here. So maybe there are many situations, like for instance, you have this, this, uh, sol this solute, uh, triglycine in a urea water mixture. Urea is known to, to denature proteins and one would be interested how different uh, pieces of, of a protein chain react to a mixture of, of urea and water then, of course, I do not need urea and water way out here in all the details. I only need to know it here locally. And can I really develop a method which allows us to look at that? Or, or in, a, in a simpler way, so I have an organic solute here, which is in water. And I only need the water somewhere in the surrounding here. And here I do not need the water. What I need is I need a, a solid algorithm which is proven to work properly, that the exchange of the molecules here and there, uh, from here in and out, uh, is, is the same as if I would run this in a big all atom simulation box. That's one way of looking at it. The other way is I could think of running a simulation on a coarse grained level. And then I say, hey, some, something interesting might be, might be going on here. And when I want to, then I want to be able to zoom in and look at it in more detail. And this zooming in, of course, has to be done that this is thermodynamically consistent with this simulation here. Because if it's not consistent, uh, by zooming in, I change the structure and I change whatever. And it, uh, not necessarily what I see here is not necessarily what I have uh, expected to see or what I wanted to look at when I, when I start to look into these systems. So the kind of requirements for this is, um, uh, and, and the question marks here, here uh, denote parameters or, or properties which in the end, at least for some cases, we can release. But let's start with that. So what I would like to have is, if I have this coarse grain simulation, I would have like to have, of course, the same mass density here and here, because otherwise it doesn't make sense to look and then zoom in. Uh, it should have the same temperature. Most important, there should be no free energy barrier for a particle diffusing from here and becoming all atom and going out and becoming coarse grained again. This is, of course, a crucial point. I need smooth transition forces. I need the same center center G of R. That is also clear if I want to do it like this. And, uh, and this all summarizes in, into the condition that I need a free exchange 
between these different regimes. And for simplicity, one would prefer to stick to two body potentials, but this is not, not really uh, crucial. If you think of it, at least uh, in the beginning, that helped us to a certain extent is one can, one can uh, think of this as a kind of geometry introduced first order phase transition. Um, and that one has a kind of phase equilibrium between these, these two regimes, but uh, this, this analogy doesn't carry us uh, uh, very far. And eventually, of course, one would like to extend this not only to the situation that one has all atom here, so periodic boundary conditions in this direction, uh, coarse grain here, and then continuum, so that one can really look into uh, uh, systems with uh, external shear boundary conditions and, and things like this. So let's start from the beginning. Well, uh, we have this, this kind of prototype molecule, which is a little tetrahedron. We also did all this with water, but this little tetrahedron has the big advantage because it doesn't have electrostatics, so we don't have long-range forces. And let's start with this short-range forces to, to begin with. So what is my problem? The problem is I have this liquid of tetrahedra here, and here I have my coarse grained model of this tetrahedron, which is just a sphere. If I look at the free energy <coughs> uh, in this system, so same density here and here, when I have a free energy uh, of, a of a system per particle, in this region, which is, uh, let's say, that value, and I have a free energy in this region, which is, let's say, that value. This is just a cartoon. Uh, a priori, it's, it's absolutely not, not set that it has to be like this. It can also be like this. So that is, uh, that is a different issue. And then I have a, a transition region between these two regimes. And what I wrote here for the free energy, of course, can, uh, can apply to the pressure, can apply to order parameters, if you think of water, you have this tetrahedral order parameter, uh, which if you have a spherical model for water here, and here you have a real water molecule, so there's absolutely no reason that this order parameter here is the same. Just the G of R is the same, but that doesn't mean that this order parameter is the same. So there will be natural differences between these different models. And to give you an extreme example is, uh, is water again. So what you can do is you can, for instance, have water here as, as a coarse-grained model and an all-atom model, here, water, a single water molecule is just a single sphere, and here it's a, <coughs> it's a SPCE in that case, and then the single sphere again. And then you, and you want to parameterize that model here so that the G of R's perfectly match. And that means uh, you can zoom in anywhere if you, if you want. And here is the radial distribution function of a, I don't remember that's the center of mass of the oxygen, but this is uh, essentially the same, of the all atom simulation and then in these different, uh, different setups. And you see uh, that they are essentially indistinguishable. One can even uh, go a little bit beyond, but it doesn't change anymore. And when you then look at the compressibility uh, uh, in the all atom and in the coarse grained region, you see that the compressibility is given by the inverse density uh, times one plus the integral of density times this correlation function. And there's nowhere a force or a potential, it's just the G of R. And if I match the G of R perfectly, then it means that the compressibility here and the compressibility here is the same. And you can actually look at this, of course, and it, and it works if you do the simulation properly. And that means that the fluctuation of particles here, here in, 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 a, in test volumes and here is to be the same. And this is very important if I want to look, uh, have the right exchange between the different regions. Either oxygen, oxygen, or center of mass, which is more or less the same, yeah. And, and, uh, and that means that uh, the, the, uh, the fluctuation of the number of molecules, not particle, number of, mo number of molecules to be really precise, you're right, uh, here, here, and here uh, is the same. This, of course, does not hold for the pressure, because the pressure is given by this kinetic energy part, and times the forces times the G of R. And the forces, of course, in, in the, in the coarse-grained region are different because the, the model, you have a different model uh, than in the all-atom model. And in the case of water, because you switch from a, from a model with electrostatic interaction to a uh, model which has just soft sphere interactions, is, is dramatic. And why is this so? Well, when you do a structure-based coarse-graining without any pressure correction, you start out here from the atomistic region and when you, you go to, so to speak, you keep the equation of state, the shape of the equation of state, 
but you move the equation of state just up or down. That was that what, that's what these two equations showed before. If I introduce a pressure correction, I have to move this black curve of a coarse grained system, of system B, back onto this point where I had my all atom situation. And when I move it around in one way or the other, typically I get a different slope here. And that means that the compressibility changes if I fit the pressure, while the pressure changes in this simple uh, structure-based coarse graining if I uh, keep the compressibility but I change the pressure if I do it like this. And in the case of water, this is dramatic. In the case of water, you keep the compressibility on the coarse grained and atomistic level, but the pressure increases by a factor of 6,000. And so this you have to compensate. So if you do something like this, you can uh, and, and do not have some compensation uh, through this transition regime, uh, of course, that will push, uh, will push molecules from the coarse grained region into the atomistic region, and you have a, you know, water at 6,000 bar is solid at room temperature. There's no, nothing going on anymore. So how, how, can we, how can we deal with that? So uh, again, so we want to have this free exchange of molecules, no free energy barriers, smooth transition forces, and statics as well as dynamics should be preferred. There are different ways of doing that, uh, of in, and introducing interpolation schemes and corrections then uh, between these regions. So you can either, uh, of course, the forces should be anti-symmetric on exchange of particles, that's clear, you, otherwise you don't have Newton's third law. Um, if you do that, you have to, inter I will come back to that later, you have to introduce force interpolation. And there's a nice paper by Luigi De Lecite who proved that if you do force interpolation, you can prove that you do not have a Hamiltonian which is conservative. When, you, when I talk to people from, from the Monte Carlo community, they say, oh, if you don't have Hamiltonian, you can't do that. Uh, you need a Hamiltonian to do Monte Carlo. That is correct. If I talk to people from the non-equilibrium simulation community, they say, oh, so what? We never have a Hamiltonian. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I think in the end we can bring these, these, these views together. So we can also introduce an, an energy interpolation. Then, of course, Monte Carlo is possible and have, when we have well-defined ensembles. However, then you can show that Newton's third law is not fulfilled exactly. So it's a kind of choice what, what you want to do. So let's start with the with uh, first approach and, and which illustrates this. So if you, if you interpolate energies, let's say, in that way, that I have a a resolution function for particle alpha and a resolution part a function for particle beta, which smoothly interpolates from, from atomistic, let's say, to coarse grained, so from uh, W equal 1 or omega equal 1 to omega uh, equal 0. I can write my, my interaction potential like this. So I have an atomistic and a coarse grained uh, part, and then, uh <coughs> and then I can calculate the forces between particle alpha and beta. So as gradient alpha u and gradient beta u, so I get the standard Newtonian term, and when I get this term here, we have the, the gradient of the, uh, of the omega function or w function x al the, as a, as pos at the position of x alpha and at the position of x beta, and that means that these forces are not the same. So if I do it like this, the forces are not the same. And uh, this is this paper by, by Luigi de Lecite. So what one can do is, uh, and, and of course, one has to, uh, has to take care of the drift terms and, and has this problem. Uh, that also would lead, if one is not careful, at, at incons mathematical inconsistencies at the boundaries, but that I'm not going to, to talk about here. So if one can avoid this by simply saying, well, I do not interpolate the interaction energies, I interpolate simply the forces. So what I do is I simply forget, forget this term and then I have a force interpolation between these two regimes and uh, can properly simulate the systems. I have a well-defined temperature, I have everywhere well-defined temp pressure and so on and so on. So the system is perfectly under control and I can run the system. Actually, there are similar problems, not exactly the same, but, but, but p uh, that certain aspects of the forces simply are neglected in the constant pressure algorithm of Hans Andersen which is then also Parinello Raman. Uh, I once said it like this when, when Michele Parinello was sitting in the first row. He said, no, but that is something different. Uh, but, but of course, he had to admit that they kind of skip a piece in the Lagrangian to, to have a proper description of the system.
Okay, so this is the summary of, of uh, what I just said. So the pressure, temperature, and density are everywhere well defined, but it needs, of course, a thermostat because I need a thermostat which, ac uh, which accounts for the difference in the free energy or, or um, whatever thermodynamic potential one, one has there in the coarse grained and the optimistic region, which might be, might be like this. So this I have to introduce. I can approximately look at that by running slices of diff at different resolutions of lambda. And of course, in a slice, if I do not vary lambda there, there I have a perfectly defined system. And that gives me a kind of approximate, whoops, a approximate uh, shape of, a, of the excess chemical potential for my uh, particles going from the coarse grain into the atomistic region and then vice versa. And this I can use to, to construct a compensating force to, to a first approximation and then I can iterate this. And when I do this, so this is the first force coming from this plot I just showed before. And that is then the result of the iteration. And if I do this for the simple case of the tetrahedral molecules, I find that the density in the coarse-grained region, the hybrid region, and the atomistic region, and so on, is perfectly flat. And if you look at the diffusion paths of the molecules, they do not see anything of a barrier. So this can be used. And, uh, um, and what is another aspect, and, and this will become very important later on, so the way it's done here is that the excess uh, chemical potential here and there essentially is, is the same, which means the difference is zero. But there's absolutely no reason why this, why this transition zone cannot perform work. I can adjust this so that this transition zone performs, performs work on the systems. And that means that I'm in principle I should be able uh, to couple very, very different systems. And you will see examples of that uh, later on. And uh, you can do this then also uh, with respect to pressure and so on, but I don't want to go into the details here. So how does this look like for a typical example of water? So when you run this uh, simulations for water, introducing the proper uh, compensation force or thermodynamic force, what is plotted here is the fluctuation of, of uh, number of particles in, in test slabs, atomistic, hydri, hybrid, and, and coarse-grained, and you see that uh, the, the blue line is the fully atomistic line, and, and uh, <coughs> the yellow la line is the adaptive resolution line with a proper uh, force compensating for the pressure differences, and that is the ansatz without any pressure difference, which of course is, is different then. And here you see the pressure in, uh, in, in the atomistic region, it's, it's one bar or zero within this accuracy here, and then it goes up in the transition region and levels off at around, at around 6,000. And what is more important in this context is that the distribution of particles in a test slab of a given size in the, uh, in the, um, in the coarse grained region, in the atomistic region, and for an all atom uh, simulation is a nice Gaussian distribution and is the same in all cases. So in this respect, such an algorithm has these problems under control and, and, and can be used for different applications. And this can be extended also to systems where one has a continuum, a coupling to the continuum that was done with Rafa Delgado Buscaglioni, and we looked at, at shear flow, and you see the shear, the flow, uh, the oscillatory patterns when, when we move the boundary here and move the boundary here, how it goes through this uh, uh, particle-based system. So, but still, being a physicist, having not, not and, and trained in statistical mechanics in, in the good old times of critical phenomena and so on, not having a Hamiltonian is something which, which you don't like. So uh, how, can, how can we uh, combine these things and, and how, how, what can we do? Well, this is our start, so and, and one can repair this by going to an additive instead of a multiplicative uh, coupling. So this is our starting point again. And uh, now I write it in a slightly different way. I have my Hamiltonian in the atomistic region. I have a Hamiltonian in the coarse grained region. And, uh, and then a mixed Hamiltonian in a way that lambda alpha, that, that you write it here as the, the uh, sum over the potential lambda alpha v1 for particle alpha plus 1 minus lambda alpha v0 of particle alpha. So and you do not have this uh, uh, multiplicative but an additi additive coupling. 
And you see many authors here, and, and the reason why there are so many authors is that the outcome of what I'm now going to talk about is, is the result of many more or less loud discussions in, in the courtyard of the ITP in Santa Barbara when there was a program and we were kind of caught there for four weeks uh, discussing these things. Uh, when, you, when you write it now like this, uh <coughs> you have a potential energy like this, and of course you can adopt the force interpolation as I had before, and then it simply looks like this. Instead of a product, you have simply the sum here, but the outcome is the same. And now you can uh, write this down in a, in a unified scheme so that you have uh, a Hamiltonian, and then you have the forces coming from that Hamiltonian for the force kind of interpolation, and then you have this term similar to what we had before. And I can define a model E, -E epsilon, for the energy interpolation, and I can define a model F for the force interpolation and see how they relate to each other. But l first, let's look at, at, this, at this part, because the way it's written here, uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, property, because that, that immediately looks like a result or something related to thermodynamic integration. And, and what one can show is that this term here, at least approximately, can be interpreted as, as uh, a position-dependent thermodynamic inter interaction of the Hamiltonian, and in that case, the average Hamiltonian at this position, lambda, across this transition region. And so one can introduce a, a compensation force, a free energy compensation force, which, uh, which is given by the fact that, that this free energy compensation force is uh, equal to the average of this term times the gradient of lambda alpha at that point. Because that is, if I have a particle there and I have my fluctuating system, this is the, in the average the force this, which uh, this particle feels upon this fluctuating surrounding. And by this I can approximately repair uh, for, for this situation. And that actually allows us to do microcanonical simulations and allows us to do Monte Carlo. And of course, one can uh, extend this so that one not only looks at Helmholtz free energy, but can, uh, but when it can also looks at the, the Gibbs free energy. And that means I, I can take my atomistic region and my coarse grained region, and in principle, I can choose from my coarse grained region whatever I want, if I have a proper Hamiltonian, and use then the generalized Helmholtz free energy or Hel uh, integ thermodynamic integration to interpolate between these different systems, which then allows me to couple these systems. So I have my equation of state, for instance, for the uh, atomistic system I'm locally looking at, and I have an equation of state on, 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 uh, of that coarse grain system, whatever that then is, and depending on, on my, my boundary conditions, I can link these different systems in, in different ways and, uh, and have an equilibrium between these different regions uh, when it comes to the exchange of particles between atomistic and coarse grain. I can go on uh, and, and discuss this in more detail in a way that I compare this uh, force-based and, and uh, <coughs> energy-based description. So um, I, when I say that I introduce a, color, a colored noise with memory function, which is just this average drift force locally with a fluctuating particle. If I do it like this, I can go on. I don't want to go into the detail, but what I can say is that the drift force the absence of a drift force uh, is, is the same as introducing an autocorrelated random noise uh, in the Hamiltonian energy conserving scheme. So what I can show is that the force-based adaptive resolution simulation can be interpreted as the energy-based adaptive resolution simulation with a colored noise. And that puts it in a general theoretical framework. It's not so important for, for practical applications. However, I think it's important for the general understanding and also being, uh, being able to, to, to decide which approach to use depending on which kind of physical question I, I would like to answer. So what we have is, so we have this, this starting situation uh, <coughs> with this memory kernel for the random forces and it's either leading to the Hamiltonian scheme with the uh, uh, with a, typically with a thermostat uh, generalized Landau equation and uh, uh, not a uh, Langevin equation, sorry, of a force-based model but with a history-dependent uh, friction. I don't know how much time I still have. 
Okay, good. Uh, let me get to a few examples, so, so, uh, because otherwise you might say, so what the hell is, is he doing? Why, why is this of use? The first simple example, and this is on the other hand very important when looking at growth processes where we want to feed in molecules under well-controlled conditions, is the coupling to an ideal gas. I said you essentially can couple uh, any system uh, to each other. And what we have done here is looking at, at uh, SBC water in the atomistic region and, uh, <coughs> and an ideal gas of coarse-grained water here in this region. And, uh, and by introducing the appropriate free energy compensation function, we keep the density here, the fluctuations here, perfectly okay as if we would have a full-blown all-atom simulation while we have here an ideal gas system which allows for an extremely fast exchange of particles. And we're using that now to study growth phenomena in coupling to, to a heat bath in a, in, a, in a different context. And that this works, you, you can see here. So what, you, what I show here, that are the different correlation functions. Of course, they match, but I think what is, what is more interesting is when you look at the normalized density, the average density in the atomistic region, hybrid, and uh, uh, <coughs> ideal gas region, that is a constant with almost zero fluctuations if you use the uh, uh, adaptive resolution scheme with the Kirkwood thermodynamic integration-based free energy compensation, and then it's just, uh, just flat. And uh, when you look at typical slabs of particles and see how they, they the slab widens as, uh, as a measure of a diffusion, you see that this nicely behaves like a Gaussian, and you can do this quantitatively, of course. And, and the more direct uh, proof of that this works nicely is that you look at the compressibility, which of course is an ideal gas much higher than in, in the real water. And uh, even though we have this perfect density match here, you have the compressibility of a fully atomistic system over the whole box. And now you take this very same system and have a small uh, all-atom region coupled to an ideal gas. And you see in the all-atom region you have the same compressibility and then, of course, it dramatically increases because the they can easily uh, go through each other. Uh, and uh, another direction which goes in a completely different direction, in a recent uh, very nice collaboration with Mark Tuckerman at, at NYU, and also uh, originally also uh, Davide Donadia was involved in the first part. Uh, we can, we can uh, uh, couple classical and path integral quantum calculations uh, in, in the very same scheme. There's also some very nice work by Luigi Del Cita in Berlin using this idea that the particles, that the classical particles, particle becomes a kind of uh, ring polymer description. That's the famous idea of Feynman. And when you then go from the quantum region to the classical region, your mass related to the uh, quantum aspect becomes larger and larger and eventually the particle, the particle shrink to a point particle while the overall motion of a particle you, uh, you do by, by a classical approach. And um, this is a, a recent, a recent uh, picture of this paper we just submitted uh, to, uh, with Centroid MD <coughs> together with a group of Mark, with Mark Tuckerman. Carlson Kreis spent some months in New York. So you see the typical fluctuations of the hydrogens and, and, and oxygens in the, classic, in the quantum region, here's the transition region, and here you see the same uh, in the classical region, and that's a kind of zooming into that. You see the, the, uh, the way the particles are, are delocalized. De and again, when you look at the direct measures uh, of what is going on, so what you have here, you have the radius of gyration. Uh, that, that was a previous paper with, with Davide Donadio on power hydrogen. Uh, <coughs> the rate of duration of, of the hydrogen, which is uh, essentially zero in the classical region, and then goes up to about uh, uh, half an angstrom, so the diameter is about an angstrom in the classical region, and again you have a density here. And when I now look at the, at the more recent stuff with water, where we also look at the oxygen, uh <coughs> the, uh, the black curve is the final curve with the proper corrections of a free energy, the density then is the same. And here you see the delocalization of uh, the size of the particles, so the hydrogens in the water in the, in the atomistic, uh, in the, all at, uh, sorry, the quantum region, hybrid region, 
and classical region, and this dotted line is the full uh, quantum calculation of a full system. So we have these subsystems which, when you look at them, you cannot decide whether they are in a big system or a small system. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. 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 So in this, and here you see it for the oxygen, and uh, so even that the oxygen is, is in the quantum region, not really a point particle. You see a little bit of, of uh, fuzziness of the particle. And you can look at the G of R's. Uh, of a full quantum adaptive and full classical. So for the, for the oxygen, oxygen G of R, you only see a minimal shift uh, from the classical to the quantum pass. But of course, you see more when you look at oxygen, hydrogen, but dramatically is hydrogen, hydrogen. That's classical. And the, the uh, adaptive resolution and the full quantum uh <coughs> simulation uh, doesn't show any difference. And uh, for the uh, tetrahedral order parameter, all three scenarios give a very good representation of the systems. And even dynamics, because it's centroid MD, you can do, you can look at the spectrum, the wave number, and, and uh, this is a kind of diffusive mode. This is the angular fluctuation of the oxygens, of the hydrogens with the uh, oxygen, hydrogen bond factors, and this is the stretch uh, oscillation of the hydrogens with the oxygens. And again, uh, you see here the, the classical one, and this is the adaptive and full quantum, and you cannot see any difference. So that perfectly, that perfectly works. Let's go to a different system, namely to uh, polymers. There's one very interesting, uh, uh, one very interesting situation which are people people are looking at in, in the context of smart polymers. When you look at, uh, for instance, polyniapam in water and alcohol, you see that water is a perfectly good solvent and wa alcohol is a perfectly good solvent. And now. You, you, you add alcohol to the water and the polymers fall out of solution and eventually expand again. So this is very strange. Two good solvents, mix them together, lead to a quote unquote a poor solvent. And if you look into the phase diagram, you have an LCST, a lower critical solution temperature, and this goes down significantly when you add the alcohol. And that is what one would like to understand. And I don't want to go uh, into the details. The way one works, looks at this is using the Kirkwood buff integrals which give directly access to excess chemical potentials and so on and so on. I don't want to go to the details here. The way we looked at this is the following. We have a small, but you cannot see because the colors don't work properly, a small polyniapam chain here in water and alcohol. Here we have a coarse grained water and alcohol, and in this that has periodic boundary conditions. Here we have an exchange region where water and alcohol can exchange so that this chain in here always feels the same kind of infinite supply of water and alcohol. So there is no depletion of alcohol or water in the region of a chain. And that means one can do this with fairly small systems. And when one arrives at a, so that's a kind of chain, and when one arrives at a very interesting conclusion, that's what one would expect for the shift in chemical potential as a function of the alcohol concentration. So uh, it's like this, and then it has to be more costly to get the chains into solution, so they collapse, and eventually they expand again. And this is what you find. There's no, thing, no such thing like this. So that means the chains, you add, the, you add alcohol, the chain collapse, while thermodynamically the solvent becomes better. And the question is how can one understand this and can one really use this for, for construction of new molecules? And what one can actually show is that this is related to the fact alcohol is a much better solvent than water, so per, per monomer it's about about four, uh, four, K, 4 kT. And that means when you have a little bit of alcohol, the, the, the polymer tries to share around the alcohol. That leads to an overall collapse, still with pieces dangling out, which are in a good solvent. And once the chain is completely decorated with alcohol, the chain expands again. And when you look into the literature, uh, these problems have been discussed in many cases, but nobody understood it. But putting it into this general frame, uh, uh, seems to work uh, quite nicely and I think is now more or less generally accepted. And we are now collaborating with, uh, with different chemists to make special copolymers to have multi-responsive polymers, which are of, of various interest. At the very end, I would like to, to go uh, to a recent development where we link rather different uh, scales to each other. Namely, we look at, at a small biopolymer in, in water and the first thing we looked at is how many water layers do you need 
in order to have a proper structure here and the proper fluctuations in the sur at the surface. And the result is uh, simply, I want to make it very short, is you essentially need two water layers. And that's all you need to have a local structure of a protein properly reproduced. You do not need more. Uh, this is what I want uh, to show at the end because I think this is a very interesting development also pointing into different directions. So this is uh, an adaptive resolution si uh, simulation of um, uh, uh, hen egg white lysozyme. And what we would like to do is we don't want to run this, of course, all at them, and it also doesn't make sense uh, in many cases for the whole system. What we would like to do is we would like to concentrate on the atomistic region where, which is important for ligand binding. So here's a kind of discussion of the details there, and I just want to show the idea. The idea is we map this, we map this model onto one of these well-established elastic network models, which are able to properly uh, take into account these hinge band fluctuations of this, of this protein that fluctuates like this, but only keep, keep the uh, region which is chemically active all atom, and then plug this into a, a general uh, uh, atomistic resolution uh, regime with, with uh, scheme with this adaptive resolution scheme. So what we have is we have this uh, network, elastic network model, we have a local atomistic region where we have a surrounding of all atom water with this atomistic resolution region and then we couple that to a coarse grained water. So this is the kind of uh, simulation set up and, uh, and, and this worked nicely and we could show that the binding free energies of a typical substrate uh, within the error bars are, are the same as if you do the full blown simulation of, of a molecule. And uh, this is a kind of ansatz which I hope allows us to really look at much larger systems where local binding then eventually couples into, into the conformational fluctuations of a protein. So that are the uh, typical root mean square fluctuations and so on which we test. And we, we are able to adjust the, the uh, shape of the at atomistic region and so on and so on. So let me conclude. I think uh, what is needed for many, many uh, problems is what really has to link these different uh, scales in a systematic way. Non-bonded interactions are a problem, especially when it comes to larger molecules. I think even that already explains the need for coarse-grained uh, coarse models, which one can parameterize in a different way. Of course, these electronic properties, that's a different issue again. Uh, absolutely crucial for, for future, I think, is to look into molecular processes aggregation dynamics, aggregation mechanisms and dynamics, not just at the end, at the outcome. And I think what one has to keep in mind in this context that essentially every material we deal with, bio, non-bio, uh, is a result of a non-equilibrium process. So it means the material is a result of the process, how you made it. And if you make it different, you typically get a different material. And this is something we eventually we have to understand and have to be able to tackle. And that's it. Thank you very much.